Thank you, Stephen. I'm live. Okay. Take that. So uh, the first time I heard of emergence, um, I was listening to a podcast from NPR, and they talked about emergence, and uh, uh, that piqued my interest, and then I kind of forgot about it for a long time. And then uh, Pat Barr came up to me not too long ago, and she said, uh, how would you like to do another talk for the humanists? And I said, what on, Pat? <laughs> so, so here we are. So you can blame Pat. Uh, so what is emergence? Uh, I'll tell you in a minute. But there are different kinds of emergence. Uh, there's a network-based emergence, group intelligence. Evolution uh, is, a, is a kind of emergence. And then there's cellular automata. So it's not just one thing, it's kind of pervasive throughout everything. Um, I bought a book called Emergence. Don't bother. You'll learn more from my talk than I learned from that book. But anyway, this is how the book starts. Uh, there's this woman, Evelyn Fox Keller, PhD in physics, uh, wrote her dissertation on molecular biology. And she met this other guy, Keller, uh, met Lee Siegel, an applied mathematician, and he shared her interests. And when a boy and a girl get together, they talk about slime mold. <laughs> uh, so the particular slime mold they, they got interested in was uh, Dictostelium discoidium. Uh, it's the best known of a group. And um, the interesting thing about slime mold is that it's actually a single-celled animal. It's an amoeba. But they feed on bacteria. Uh, that grows in the, under leaves in the forest. But when they run out of food, they get together and they turn into a single organism. So this is an organism that can live independently as a single-celled animal, or it can live in a group. Uh, so when they come together, uh, this is what it looks like. And the big question for these people was, uh, how do they know how to do this? How do they know uh, that it's time to get together, and when it's time to get together and form a single animal, how do you know where to go to find all your friends and team up like that? So who's in charge was the big question. Uh, what they found out, though, was when an amoeba is not getting enough food, it produces a chemical. And it leaves this chemical wherever it goes. And the chemical has a certain strength to it based on how well fed it is. And when it gets hungry, the individual amoeba see that there are trails from other amoeba of uh, varying strength, and then they, they pull themselves together into a single organism. So this process gives the appearance of somebody being in charge and saying, okay, it's time to form up. But there is nobody in charge. It's all up to the individual amoebas. And to the biologists at the time, it didn't make any sense because the thinking of the day was that everything is directed by something. Right? Somebody's in charge. There's a pacemaker. Uh, and they couldn't find anything. And it took a lot of experiments and 10 years before this became the accepted premise of how these things get together. And it had to be rigorously proven, of course. And now 30 years after it was first discovered, this is common knowledge. And the lesson that they learned from this is that in nature, if you think about it, nothing ever happens as a top-down event. There's never anybody in charge. It always bubbles up from the bottom. So what about slime mold? Uh, so I have a little video, and uh, you're not supposed to do this during a talk, but I'm going to show you this video. This comes from uh, NOVA, and if it will play. Oh, there's sound, but it's, it's pretty lame. So, here's the slime mold. This is what it looks like when it forms up into a, a single organism with all the individuals. Slime molds have no brains. They're, they don't have a nervous system. They don't even have neurons. They have nothing. But here's a case where you have a slime mold and it wants to find food. So you put food down here, and what it does is it sends out tendrils and if a tendril finds food, the tendril stays. But if it doesn't find food, it dies off. So all the ones that die off leave a map behind that says, okay, here's how you get to food. And then the slime mold grows along that path that was left by the chemical signals. And again, it looks like it's really intelligent, but it's not. There's no brain involved. 
Here's a case where they took a map of Tokyo and they put food spots where the cities are in Tokyo, and what it did was it replicated the entire uh, rail system uh, of Tokyo. And this is a rail system that it took, you know, uh, hundreds of people many years to develop, but the slime mold did it like it was nothing. So, uh, it's, it's intelligence without a brain at all, which is kind of an amazing thing. <coughs> So what is emergence? Uh, emergence comes from the word, uh, uh, I think it's a Greek word, it means bring to light or unforeseen occurrence. And there is um, a complexity theory uh, in mathematics that provides models of emergence. And emergence uh, uh, has two characteristics. There's strong emergence and there's weak emergence. Weak emergence can be understood if you understand the parts. So if you took the parts of a bicycle uh, back in time to the Renaissance and you showed a, a, you know, a sprocket and pedals and a seat and handlebars and a Renaissance person couldn't understand all those things. He doesn't know what a bicycle is, but when you start to put them together, at some point he's going to say, oh, I get it. I could sit on that and I could steer it and I could pedal it. But the bicycle emerged from all the parts, right? Strong emergence, though, can't be understood from understanding the parts. If you took a, an electrical generator back to a, a Renaissance person and you said, you know, here's a magnet and here's a coil of wire, and if I turn this crank, the magnet spins, you'd have no clue what, what you're talking about, right? So that's a strong emergence. The big deal with emergence is that emergent entities arise out of more fundamental entities and yet are novel and irreducible. So if you start with something like physics, even if you knew everything there was to know about physics, it would be almost impossible for you to predict chemistry, even though everything in chemistry comes from physics, right? You can know about mass, you can know about friction, you can know about bounce coefficients, uh, you can know about uh, electron valences, but you couldn't predict chemistry. And then when you understood chemistry, you could look back and say, oh, okay, I, I get it. I see how it relates to physics. But even if you knew all about chemistry, you probably couldn't come up with biology. That's a huge leap. You mean all these chemicals, if you mix them together, you can get something that moves on its own and reproduces itself? That's unbelievable. But then, when you do understand biology and you look back at the chemistry behind it, you say, oh, okay, I, I see how that could work. That kind of makes sense. But biology emerged out of chemistry. And then if you got biology, could you predict that animals would evolve and develop nervous systems and build a brain? Uh, probably not. Something as complex as a brain emerges out of biology, but it's not predictable. And then when you've got a brain, something else evolves, the mind. And this keeps going up and up and up. And at every layer, you couldn't predict that next layer. But you can always look backwards and say, okay, I understand how it works. So there's different kinds of emergence. There's network emergence, group intelligence, evolution, and cellular automata. And I'm going to start with networks. And the thing with networks is they have rules. In the network, and think about the amoeba, every low-level node is inter interchangeable at the start, right? Every amoeba looks like every other amoeba. So when you build up this slime mold, all the amoebas are the same. So they must have rules regarding interaction uh, based on the position they hold in the network. And there has to be some kind of communication system, and there has to be some kind of a functional threshold. So every amoeba is identical. The emergent entity slime mold arises out of the fundamental entities, yet it's novel and irreducible. And the movement is from low-level rules to higher-level sophistication. So the rules regarding interaction and position, they produce this chemical in response to food availability. If it's at a certain threshold, they move toward it. They drop trails in response to being hungry. If they delete trails in response to failure. If it doesn't find food, the trail dies <coughs> off. And then they grow along the successful trails. So they're a decentralized communication mechanism. 
is the chemical signals. And then there's a functional threshold. If you have one amoeba, it's just an amoeba. It will never be a slime mold by itself. So then the question arises, well, would two do it? If you put two amoeba together, is it slime mold? Probably not. What's the number? There's a magic number somewhere. Uh, another example of this is ant colonies, uh, where the microbehavior of individual ants creates the overall colony. And it's an emergent, self-organizing system. In the past, people thought, and a lot of people thought, that the queen, uh, the one that laid all the eggs, the big ant, she was in charge and she told all the other ants what to do. And that was a long-held belief. Because otherwise, how do you explain the organization of ants? But it's not true. Colonies are not ruled, and they're not command economies. Nobody tells anybody what to do. And then, but yet, you get this complex organization arising. Uh, this is a, a harvester ant midden. Uh, harvester ants, what they do is they collect garbage um, in and around the ant nest, and they move it to a garbage dump. Which, you know, nobody told them you have to have a garbage dump. Nobody told them there's a good reason to have a garbage dump. Nobody told them where to put it. And yet they do it. They also have a cemetery. And the cemetery and the garbage dump are on opposite sides of the ant nest, equidistant from the ant nest, so that they don't interfere with each other. And again, this all happens automatically. Uh, so Edward Wilson was looking at this, how do ants work? And uh, he suspected that, that ants were leaving a, a chemical trail. It's a pheromone trail. And the way he figured out how it worked was he dissected ants. Imagine dissecting an ant and finding that there's a little uh, tail that comes out of the ant and a gland attached to that little tail. And when it drops the tail, the gland secretes a chemical that draws a line on the ground. He figured that out with a microscope and a pair of tweezers and a tiny little scalpel and wow. Um, another thing he found out in doing his research was <clears throat> an ant brain has very few cells. Ants are not smart at all and they're blind too. So even if you took all of the ants necessary to, to make up a, a human brain, it would be 3.4 million ants it still wouldn't be the brain of a human, right? Because your brain has an architecture to it and the neurons have different purposes in different locations and so on. So no matter how many ants you get together, they're never gonna be a really smart collective and yet they do what they do. Uh, they're very successful. They rival humans in biomass. So if you think humans rule the world, yeah, they kind of do, but no more than ants do. Um, ants live everywhere, except for a few places. I can't imagine why they don't live in Polynesia. What a nice place to live, <laughs> if you're an ant. Um, but they do amazing things. They'll find the shortest route to food. Uh, they'll prioritize food sources. And they base this on things like how far away is the food and how hard is it to get to and things like that. Um, and they will change functions as they go along. So how does it all work? Well, at, at the beginning, every ant egg is identical. So here's the interchangeability of the parts. And each egg can become a different kind of ant, a queen, a drone, a worker. And they're all identical. So if you're a drone, you're just like every other drone. Um, and I used to work for AT&T, so I know what we're speaking <laughs> uh, So ignorance is useful in a case like this because you've got this huge machine. It's made of many parts, and all the parts are simple, and they're all pre-programmed, and they're all plug replaceable. So here are the rules for queens. Uh, if the colony requires a queen, what the other ants will do is they'll, they'll go modify an egg so that that egg is going to hatch a queen. And then if the colony has a virgin queen, which she will be when she hatches, they'll convert other eggs into drones. And then the queen says, well, I'm a virgin and here are the drones. And there's a chemical signal that passes between them and they all take off. 
and they fly away and they mate in the air. And if you're a drone <clears throat> and you're lucky enough to make it with the queen, you die. <laughs> That's your reward. <laughs> Uh, and then if the queen is fertilized, she flies back to the nest and she starts laying eggs. And the ants around her <coughs> take on the function of taking care of her. <coughs> and they do some really interesting things. They, do, they dig an escape tunnel below the chamber where she lays her eggs. And if anything happens, uh, there's an attack on the colony or whatever, they collapse the floor and she drops into the escape room and they cover it over so she's protected. And they do this with no brains and no eyes. Uh, so if you're not a queen and you're not a drone, you're a worker by default, and you operate on a set of rules for workers. <coughs> so the, the ant colonies constantly adjust the number of ants actively doing any particular job, and it's based on a bunch of variables. So again, they don't think. So how does this work? The thing with ants is, everything they perceive is at the street level, right? If you're an ant, you're blind, all you've got is pheromone trails to follow. That's it. And occasionally you run into another ant. <clears throat> so everything that works for an ant colony has to work at that level. It's like pheromones and touching. That's all you've got. And that rolls up to about 10 to 20 signals. That's all ants operate on. So whatever rules rule the world of ants, it has to operate on just those 10 to 20 signs, and they include touching and pheromones. So what happens is this, an ant's walking along, and uh, he meets another ant, and he touches the other ant, and he says, I'm looking for food. And the other ant says, me too. And then they go about their business. And the ant keeps going, and we'll call him... Uh, Anthony. Uh, so Anthony keeps walking along and he meets another ant and he says, I'm looking for food. And the other ant says, me too. And Anthony keeps walking along and meets another ant, I'm looking for food, me too. Well, what's happening is there's a counter in Anthony's head. And remember, he's only got 25,000 neurons, so a lot of what this ant is doing is calculating numbers. So the dedication of the primary part of this ant's brain is just counting things. And he's so far counted so many ants that are looking for food, and he gets to a threshold, and the threshold says, I've got to stop looking for food. There's too many ants doing that. He doesn't actually say that, of course. But, but a trigger goes off. And then he moves over to another column that says, okay, stop looking for food, start doing something else. Start cleaning up the colony. So then he heads back to the colony. He runs into an ant. And they do the, I'm, I'm going to clean the colony. And the other one goes, no, nah, I'm looking for food. Right? And, and that's the way it works. Um, another thing that happens is, suppose he goes on looking for food, and he reaches a food source. As soon as he finds the food source, he drops a pheromone trail back to the nest, and he takes the food with him. So another ant's out looking for food, and he sees the pheromone trail, he smells it rather, and he follows that, and he finds food too. So he drops his tail and leaves the pheromone trail. Now the pheromone trail is twice as strong. So we're building a roadmap now to that food, and the ants keep finding, more ants keep finding that pheromone trail, as long as they keep finding food, they keep dropping more pheromones back to the food. So they built a map. They also have alarm behavior, uh, and they have things like necrophoric behavior. Let's get, to these dead, get rid of the dead ants, we'll take them to the cemetery, let's get rid of the garbage, we'll take that to the dump. So everything the ants do is based on the patterns they have programmed into their brains, uh, gradients and pheromone trails, and ratios of workers with given missions. And they give themselves the missions. And then there are ratios of different missions, too. Uh, because a, an ant might come along and never find another ant that's dedicated to doing a particular job. So the counter for that job is zero. Right? So he's got to balance that. Well, I found 25 ants doing this job and zero doing this job. I should go do that one. So they, they do this all with statistics. <coughs> so based on the number of ants they encounter, the roles they have, the amounts and types of pheromones, 
the target resources they encounter, the dangers they encounter, random encounters. They take all this raw data and they basically run a statistical analysis to determine how they behave. And this is with very little brain, 250,000 neurons. So the, the decentralized communication mechanism in this case is paying attention to your neighbors, the markers, the environment, collect the data, perform the analysis, compare the current state to the desired state, and then modify your behavior to get to the desired state. And the desired state is called homeostasis. And in the case of ants, just like it was uh, the case with the amoeba, more is, is different. It, it, generally speaking, it's better in, the, in terms of emergence uh, because the statistical analysis of 10 ants can't be accurate. But if you've got 2,000 ants, then they'll tend to average out. And this is called group intelligence. I'm going to talk about that a little more later. Um, so the message is micromotives lead to macro behavior. And again, there's a critical mass to this. The brain works the same way. Uh, the brain is filled with neurons, and you've got different areas in the brain that have different functions. Like, here's where visual information comes in from the optic nerve. Right next to that is the visual association area. Well, here's where auditory information comes in, and here's the auditory association area. And then here's the speech area, and look, it's between auditory and reading comprehension and visual association. So the brain is laid out very nicely uh, for different functionality to be next to the functionality required for it to work at its best. But in any functional area of the brain, the neurons are all the same. So there must be some emergent quality of, of collections of neurons that lead to intelligence. So there have to be rules of a neuron's interaction. And of course, the rules are going to change slightly depending on where in the brain the neuron happens to be. And also what kind of neuron it is makes a difference. But each neuron is connected for, to from 1 to 10,000 other neurons. So they're all communicating all the time with neurotransmitters. And not only do they feed in one direction, but there's a feedback capability as well. It's called back propagation. Uh, and the human brain has between 85 and 100 billion neurons, all acting in parallel. So the auditory part of your brain works all by itself, independently of the visual part of your brain. They're both working simultaneously. So you've got several very large computers running in your head all at the same time, doing different functions. Neurons are not brains. Brains are a collection of neurons. And this is the way neurons work. <coughs> You've got signals coming in called excitation signals. So like um, in your inner ear, there's, there's this thing shaped like a seashell and it's got hairs inside it called cilia. And when you hear a certain sound, some of those cilia vibrate and some don't, depending on what the sound is, right? The frequency of the sound, the volume of the sound, and so on. And when the cilia vibrates, it sends out little pulses along um, a nerve that gets to the part of the brain that understands what those pulses stand for. So that part of the brain, those neurons that receive those pulses, get trained that those pulses mean something. Uh, so you've got all these excitation signals coming in, and they're just, they're just like boop, 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 boop. <coughs> then you've got other signals coming in that are inhibitors. Um, why would you have that? Because in your brain, all these neurons are connected to hundreds of thousands of other neurons, right? So you don't want to get a feedback loop going where this neuron excites this neuron, who excites this neuron, and it comes back to the first one, and you've got this, this loop going on. So what happens is, if that occurs, the first neuron sends a back propagation signal to dampen that. And then finally, you get some output. And that goes to the next level of neurons. So it's a very simple thing, right? They've actually figured out, scientists have figured out, what the equation is that runs in that neuron. And they all run the same equation. 
So your brain emerges from all of these neurons that are all pretty much identical, running pretty much the same equation. The number of neurons makes a difference, and the types of neurons makes a difference, because you've got motor neurons, and you've got neurons that are dedicated to more primal functions. Uh, you know, your lizard brain doesn't have the same sort of neurons that your cerebral cortex has. And then the architecture of the brain comes into play. But you can say that there is a threshold where when you hit a certain number of neurons that can be dedicated specifically to thinking, right, some percentage of your neurons can be used just for thinking, you attain a level of consciousness. So a mouse, because it's a mammal, has a cerebral cortex, and with 71 million neurons, it becomes conscious. And then you get all these other animals who have more neurons, and they're all considered conscious creatures. Then you get to another level, and it's around a billion, where the animal becomes self-aware, which means if it looks at itself in a mirror, it knows it's looking at itself in a mirror, right? Cats don't get that, but dogs do. So, that, you know, that's an interesting thing. Look how many neurons an African elephant has. They must be awfully smart. Mm -hmm. well, they never forget. They never forget. It. One of the problems, though, is they have so much biomass that a lot of their neurons, a lot of their brain is just maintaining that huge animal. So it pays to have a big brain and a small body. Um, so now I'm going to talk about group intelligence, and I mentioned this before. Uh, group intelligence was first recognized in people by a guy who went to a county fair, and they had an ox in a pen, and you could give this guy, uh, I don't know, a shilling, and guess the weight of the ox. Uh, so the dude that was watching this happen said, this is very interesting because the people that are betting on the weight of this ox are all varied. Some of them are housewives. What do they know about the weight of an ox? Some of them are butchers. They should know better, you would think. Or maybe the farmer that raised the ox, he, he would understand how much oxen weigh as a rule. And you get all these varied people, butchers, bakers, lawyers, doctors, guessing the weight of this ox. So he went up to the guy who collected all the information at the beginning and he says, look, uh, I'm really interested in all the data you've collected. Can I have it when this fair is over? And uh, the man agreed. The guy who did this was uh, named Sir Francis Galton. And among other things, uh, he also invented the concept of uh, eugenics. Uh, so he's more famous for that. But he collected all these guesses and he learned some interesting things. The crowd, if you averaged all of their guesses, the average of the guesses was more accurate than any single guess in the data he collected. And he says, wow, that's amazing. I wonder if that applies to other things. So then he started looking at other activities of people to see if that was repeated anywhere else. And it turns out that it was repeated in a lot of different instances. Uh, and what he learned was that thinking and information processing such as market judgment can be faster, more reliable, and less subject to political forces than the deliberation of experts. So remember in the old days of the stock market when all the people were down on the floor and they were yelling out, corn 10, you know, oil 14, and that was group intelligence, and it kept the market stable for a long, long time, and they called it the invisible hand of the market, right? Because nobody was directing the market, it directed itself. And it was based on group intelligence. And you see it in a lot of places. Uh, the utilization of uh, a popular bar, you know, do people pour out into the street, and yeah, that's an interesting phrase, and stand there drinking, or do they move on to another bar, right? Uh, in traffic flows with lots of heavy traffic, and I, I was driving through uh, Virginia the other day, and boy, I saw this all over the place, not colliding and moving traffic flows, pedestrians optimizing the pavement flow, and so on. And nobody's directing all that stuff, and yet all that stuff just keeps happening. And it, it got to the point where now we can describe how people in a group tend to think as a whole. 
because this has been studied uh, for political and economic reasons. So in some groups, in some cases, groups are remarkably intelligent and often smarter than the smartest people in the group. And there are several conditions uh, necessary for a group to be intelligent. And a lot of people talk today about how crazy the world is getting, and I think a lot of it uh, is based on the fact that the things required for group intelligence are starting to fall apart now. Uh, so for example, you have to have diversity, independence, and decentralization. So if you've got a central authority dictating what you should be thinking, and you buy into it, that destroys group intelligence. Why? Because now the strongest member of the group who's dictating what you should think is destroying the ability of the group to think with diversity and independence. <clears throat> Best decisions are made as a product of disagreement. So if you eliminate disagreement, you destroy the ability to have group intelligence. Too much communication can make the group as a whole less intelligent. So when you see people walking around looking at their phones, this is masses of people who are in constant communication. They are no longer thinking independently. They're, they're sucked up into groupthink, and group intelligence disappears as a result. To use group intelligence, of course, you have to be able to aggregate what the group is thinking and deliver it to the right people at the right place at the right time. But if group intelligence works, then you don't really have a need for an expert for a lot of the functions that humans perform. Uh, I mentioned homeostasis before. Decreasing homeostasis actually makes, means making it worse. Uh, so positive feedback is one of the things that makes it worse. So if you're in a bubble where you only, you know, you have selected sources of information that agree with you and you keep feeding back the same data, uh, that decreases homeostasis, makes it worse. If you have an echo chamber where you only read what's interesting to you and you only get fed what's interesting to you, you know, if your thing is uh, physics uh, and you never get shown anything other than physics, you're never going to learn about biology. Uh, and then, of course, there's the media, the media being driven by uh, revenue uh, is going to do things to excite uh, an audience to get more revenue, like media events, right? We don't have, we don't have rain anymore, now we have rain events. Um, and then there's things like false equivalence, and you've seen all that. Negative feedback, on the other hand, increases homeostasis, homeostasis and makes it better. So you don't just read the news, you want to read the editorial page and find out what the argument's about. And maybe there's some information in there that supports your side or doesn't support your side, but has really good evidence. Where a atomic particle, when it changes its state, will instantly change a particle in a totally different atom, different cell. What kind, I mean, what can you, <laughs> when you have information like this, is this telling us that ent you know, entanglement is actually a prerequisite for life? Uh, no, what that tells you is that there's an evolutionary advantage to using entanglement. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there, there's, uh, some thought that the way the brain works involves things like entanglement. Uh, which is interesting because if it really does, then that opens up the possibility that you could be entangled with another person in some way, uh, you know, at that level. So is there an evolutionary advantage in a brain that uses entanglement? Well, if the brain uses entanglement as a, as a way of achieving consciousness, for example, then sure, there's an evolutionary advantage to it, and it's going to do it, uh, to, because it'll be selected for. Okay, well that's interesting, because it's sort of like, you know, there's always been a conflict between science and what people call woo-woo stuff, you know, like yeah. ESP and stuff. Thank you. Uh, thanks for another great talk. You told us about very simple animals like uh, slime molds and ants, where social organization emerges from them. 
And then we can talk about, um, say, a wolf pack, which is definitely hierarchical. Uh, it turns out it's not. Oh. Recent research has shown that the, the concept of the alpha male right. totally not like that. What I was about to ask seconds ago <laughs> is if you can point to species that are at the boundary between the bottom up and the top down. Um, perhaps, perhaps the Republican Party is a hierarchy. <laughs> well, uh, you know, humans, uh, humans do tend to do things that benefit themselves, and, and there's enough evolutionary advantage in doing that. So you're saying we're still bottom up? We could be. Uh, in a lot of ways, we could behave as a society in a bottom-up manner. And you, I mean, this organization is kind of a bottom-up organization, really. You know, we, we have a board of directors, but mainly we just deal with the mechanics of putting on these presentations. But if it wasn't for you guys coming, there would be no group, you know. And, and if we didn't all share common beliefs and belief systems, uh, there would be no group. And it wouldn't matter how good the speaker is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I'm getting back to this question. Um, yeah, um, where does it all begin? No, 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 no Richard Dawkins, he's answered all this. He's written books like The Blind Watchmaker. Yeah, good books it's, too. It's all about time. Humans can't imagine the time that evolution took. It's billions of years, and our minds just can't comprehend how it all came together over those billions of years. Yeah. So it's, it's just step by step by step by step, and I'm not steps and forward steps, but it's just molecules bouncing. Yeah, add lots of time, shake well. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, uh, I, don't, I, I, have, I studied plant morphology and how cells communicate. And, um, it's all about position, like the first cell is just alone, and then the minute you put one next to it, they are different, and, and it just gets more different and more different. Yeah, right? The first cell division, one of the cells has to say, I'm on the left side, and the yeah, other one says, I'm on the right side. When wow. You get three, and then when, you, when you get out to the surface, you become a skin cell. Yeah. It's actually very simple, but nobody... It's fine, a stem cell, why there's so much fighting over stem cells. In the, you know, the politicians don't want them, and the doctors don't study them. And they're, they're sort of a generic cell, right, that can tell yeah. you anything? Pretty much, depending on where it is. When, one of the great things about stem cells is they'll take a, a stem cell. Uh, there's a guy named Church, George Church, uh, works in New York at some university. Um, he takes stem cells and uh, genetically engineers them to become neurons, human neurons. Uh, they're human stem cells to begin with. But he takes them and converts them to human neurons and injects them in the brains of mice, and he does that to study... Um, things like Alzheimer's disease. And because the stem cell, when it wakes up in the mouse's brain and says, oh look, I'm surrounded by mouse brain cells, I must be one of them, and it fits right in and starts to divide and become more human brain cells inside the brain of the mouse and makes them very smart mice that way. <laughs> it is scary in a way, but you know, it's also pretty pretty cool uh, science. You uh, um, you started to talk about emergence, and then you started with physics, and you jumped to the brain, and then you went to the mind, and we have a trend here. What's next? <laughs> and if you're not sure, speculate. <laughs> What's next after minds? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, yeah. When you put two minds together. Uh, you don't have much, but when you put ten together, then you start to build a society, right? And then, then a, a city emerges out of that, and global markets emerge out of that. I mean, as long as you keep adding uh, and you hit thresholds, you're going to get some higher level functionality. Now, I don't know, you know, uh, I'm waiting for uh, the world of Star Trek, right? <laughs> Just about to say that. Let's go there. Yeah, speaking of... Uh Star Trek. I uh, first of all, I want to thank you. This is my first time coming to this meeting, and I hope I you come back again. Really enjoyed your talk. Um, but I'm wondering how um, artificial intelligence will um, intersect into the way our minds work, and yeah. Um, uh, 
I think the, the, the guy with the best vision of that right now is Elon Musk. And he's actually working on a thing called the neural net, which um, is a very, very, very fine mesh that can be implanted on the surface of the brain through holes drilled in the skull. Okay, and I know this is this is way out there, but he's actually doing it right now with monkeys, uh, and there are monkeys in his laboratories that have these nets on the surfaces of their brains and are connected through interfaces to a computer. And, uh, and they can do amazing things. They can operate robots to bring them a banana and, and stuff like that. I mean, uh, so if, if they're doing it in the laboratory today, then the, the only thing impeding that from becoming something that humans do is uh, organizations that are at a high level that, that look at, you know, like the FDA saying, is this safe? Uh, and, and then the question you have to ask yourself is, would you let them do that to you? And the answer is eventually going to depend on whether it's socially acceptable and advantageous. And, uh, you know, that day's going to come when it is socially acceptable and advantageous, and then, yeah, you'll do it if you're alive for it. Um, and, and it will have benefits. Um, another Star Trek analogy, though, is this whole idea of uploading your brain into a computer. Mm -hmm. That's nonsense, <laughs> right? Because that's just a copy. That's not you. Yeah. So, so I don't want to go there. But. Uh, how about going here? Um, Self-aware um, AI. Yeah. What's the threshold? What, what's, when, when will there be emergent? AI. Uh, uh, well, self-aware is different than uh, conscious, and conscious is different than, you know, just being functional. Um, ants are functional, right? They're little machines, and you have to hit a certain level of neuron, uh, number of neurons before a, an animal can become a conscious thing, uh, and another level before you can become a self-aware thing, but. That's all based on an architecture of how the brain is put together and what all the different parts of the brain are doing and also how the brain models the world. Uh, one, of the, one of the most interesting things about artificial intelligence is when you teach a computer what a cat is, you have to show it hundreds of thousands of pictures of cats. And, uh, and there was one interesting thing that happened. They were modeling... Uh, identification of a particular fish and it was a trophy fish and so everybody in a picture of this fish was holding the fish so the computer model that came out was always looking for fingers <laughs> because if it didn't see fingers then that must not be that fish because that fish has fingers on it everywhere it looks right so the computer never understood really what a fish was or with you know the concept of trophy and all of that uh, humans, on the other hand, if you show a four-year-old girl a picture of a cat and you say, this is a kitty cat, you know, she takes it in. And if you show her another picture, say, of a dog, she might say kitty cat. But then you, you correct her, you say, no, that's a dog. Uh, within three or four pictures, she gets it. She will never look at a cat and make that mistake again, or a dog and make that mistake again. Because what the human brain does is it builds a model of the world. Computers do not do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the day may come when they do build models. But then there's another question of agency. Agency is, uh, is something that evolved over hundreds of thousands of years, at least, where you see something moving in a bush, and you give it agency. You say, that's something I should be aware of. Maybe that's an animal. Maybe that's another person. Maybe that's a threat, uh, right? because you imbue it with characteristics similar to the characteristics of other agents in the world. And then at some point in evolution, you recognize that there are people in the world, agents, and they're just like you. And that's when you become self-aware. If you don't build the model of agency that includes yourself, you will never become self-aware. So. Will a computer attain that by itself, or is that something we would have to build into the computer 
for it to become self-aware. And my premise is you would have to build that in because there's no evolutionary imperative for a computer to develop that, right? Some scientist is going to have to say, I'm going to make this thing self-aware. Let me see how I can do it. And, and that's a huge step, right? Because that's when you get in the, into the arena of, well, if that be thing becomes self-aware, it could see me as a threat. Do I want to do that? You know, is that where I want to go? I don't know. Uh, better to have a slave population of robots, I think, than, <laughs> than a self-aware population of robots. Right. Yeah. So, um, there's been a number of questions to talk about top to, up, top down versus bottom up, and where does hierarchy come from? And I would. I would say that in a, in a number of situations uh, with self-organizing uh, organisms, uh, a top-down is a temporary or, an, or, or a situational response to needing to make a decision quickly. So the, the bottom-up is great, it's most effective, but it does take time. And so often, especially in societies, or in animal groups, a, a leader will be picked just to do the urgent thing, to make the quick decision. And, you know, in, in ancient Rome they had a, a somewhat distributed way of making decisions. They, had, they, they actually had a form of a republic. But when there was a crisis, they would appoint a dictator. That's the, where the where dictator come from. And the dictator would have a very limited term, but he could do anything he wanted. His word was the law. But he had six months to do it, and then that was it. And then they went back to their, their normal position. he wasn't business. a dictator anymore? Correct. Good of him to give up the position. They, they had discipline back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to, to, to say that... Sounds that, like America now. That, no. Well, except for six months. <laughs> in, in any case, it... it you, our, our societies have some pathologies because of these things, but um, but I think that where you see like the alpha dog, it's really a fairly limited role, um, and that alpha dog is really being supported by the others, and it's still much more bottom up than it than it appears. Yeah, I saw uh, I saw an interview with I don't remember what this was, but it really struck me. Um, somebody was talking to an Indian chief. And the Indian chief said, we really have to do this thing. And uh, the interviewer said, well, why don't you just tell your tribe to do it? And he says, because if I tell them to do it and they don't do it, I won't be the chief anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for this once again. Um, there was a, a statement that you made no. about, uh, oh yeah, anyway. <laughs> statement you made about uh, communication and too much communication is a negative to the to the uh, group intelligence, or I forget the phrase, but right. um, well, I've been, always had the group thing. Group, yeah, uh, I've always felt that you can't know too much, and now I'm really in doubt about that. So, is there <laughs> is there an equivalent, all right, to too much communication and too much knowledge, or are they two different things? Those are two different things, right? Commun much of communication has nothing to do with with data. Uh, it, uh, it could have a lot to do with misinformation, yeah. right, or opinion, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, trivia, uh, which may or may not have any impact on your life. But it does take up a lot of cycles, and if you get into group think, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, look at, look, at, look at what happens in things like art. Um, you know, somebody will become famous uh, because of an art movement they start, and then all the other artists who want to be successful and famous start to copy them. And pretty soon you can't buy a picture that doesn't, you know, have a particular look to it. Right. Um, and you may not even like that stuff, and yet it's all around you. Uh, and that's, you know, group think among artists. Yeah. Happens all the time. Modern music happens all the time, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I turn on the radio and uh, if I go to a pop station by accident, <laughs> uh, it all sounds the same to me. Sorry, Mike. Oh, no, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned at one point that self-awareness is not the same as consciousness. Right. So AI systems are not self-aware because they don't no. have creative model. Right. Are they conscious? Uh, no, they're not. How is it different? 
Well, you know, that's a really tough one, right? Uh, it's hard to imagine something that moves around in the world and does things that ants do and say, you know, how can they do that and not be conscious, right? It's because it has a very small number of components, neurons, and they're dedicated to particular functions. And it's a machine, and it has limited resources and capabilities. It can't think about anything because it's using every computational resource it has to do what's programmed into it to do. Uh, we have lots of extra uh, computing power that is not necessary for just functioning, right? Because, uh, I mean, you don't even have to think about finding your next meal. You open a refrigerator and there it is. Oh boy. Uh, so that gives you an awful lot of time to think about other things, like maybe I shouldn't have bought this bologna, I'm never going to eat it. And it's going to be bad. Uh, right? So, so now you're conscious because you're thinking about what's in the refrigerator, not just automatically opening the door, grabbing the thing, pulling it out, closing the door. You know, you're not a machine, uh, at least not a hundred percent machine. Uh, I've got a quick question. Just the human brain versus a desktop computer, or is there some scale of how powerful an individual brain is? Oh, geez. Uh, an individual brain? Compared to computers. I Compared to computers. It, that's a really tough thing to do because computers and brains are so different in, in terms of substrate, right? Uh, the, speed of a, the speed of a computer today is about two trillion computations a second. Human brain. Uh, neurons are only capable of like 200 computations a second. So the scales of difference are huge, but the human brain is a massively powerful parallel computer uh, where most, most computers out in the real world, uh, the number of CPUs you can get running is, you know, maybe a thousand. So big difference between the two. And, and, you know, uh, the architecture of a computer is totally different than the architecture of a human brain. And just making that comparison is just really, really tough. Uh, current thinking, though, is that uh, general artificial intelligence uh, will land somewhere between 2030 and 2045. So it's imminent. It's close, yeah. How, how does the ant colony know that... Um, that this is its boundary and the next, from a certain point on, that property belongs to the other neighboring ant colony. Okay, well they, they... When they meet each other, how do they know this is, this one is not from my, from my yeah. colony, yeah. I have to know to stop. Okay, first, first of all, ants don't know anything, right? It's all, all communication is through touching and pheromones. So an ant is following a pheromone trail, and the pheromone trail ends, and now it's in open space, right? Now this is dangerous territory for the ant because it always has to know how to get back to the colony. So it's not going to wander too far from where it is, or it's got to have some way of, you know, zero homing back in to the colony. But it has a those pheromone trails have a specific smell that's peculiar to that ant nest and those ants. And if it comes across another ant, first thing it's going to do is smell it and say, man, I don't like the way you smell. Uh, you must be a stranger, right? And of course, none of this is happening on a conscious level. It's all machinery. Uh, but the fact that there's a bad smelling ant there means it's not one of us, it's one of them. And you either run or fight. There's a genetic... Um marker of each colony that's yeah. different than the next one. Right, right. Because all the ants come from eggs that were laid by one queen, right? Uh, so they're all marked as coming from that queen. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank it you will for take coming. me a long time to absorb everything you said. Uh -huh. But I really appreciated the fact that the last word in your presentation was sociology. I mean, that's where the whole emergence is uh, taking us. Yeah. I'm a sociologist. And, um, you know, one of our uh, 
I would say, founding thinkers, August Comte, actually said that sociology was the queen of all disciplines. And in many ways, what you have uh, presented are really the nuts and bolts, the infrastructure of how humans are supposed to be functioning. That in the most uh, optimum way, where there is no hierarchy, that this is the way really in which we develop, we come to that optimum stage. Yeah. And in many ways, Adam Smith's you know, invisible hand was moving towards that, but there are so many situations today, today which are complicating that whole very, um, you know, I would say very uh, intuitive way of organizing society. But, you know, there are examples in the world today, for example, in the, in the Chiapas. And in northern Syria, before uh, the short, uh, what should I say, the short-sighted effort of our uh, 45th to, to withdraw the troops, in northern Syria, there was a group of people who were putting together a society which was non-hierarchical, mm -hmm. just like in the Chiapas. So I think anarchism and the fundamental, the natural rules, uh, the laws of society, probably are what is going to really liberate us. That's what I think. Yeah, possibly, possibly. But we may have come to a point in, uh, in, in let me back up a little bit. Uh, when you do have organizations that are running things, you do get some benefits from it, right? Uh, when you build a university that has a science department that says you've got to publish your research once a year, otherwise you can't keep your job and you end up inventing some technology that didn't exist and wouldn't exist otherwise because uh, in, a, in an anarchic society there would be no money for you to do it and no... Uh, no ability to gather graduate students around you to do it. Uh, city streets, sewage departments, all of those things come from a top-down organization. Uh, so it's got its downsides, but it's got its upsides too. Uh, could we go back to uh, a social organization where we didn't need that infrastructure is a question, and I don't know how that would work. But your example right? shows that it can be more. Right, uh, and it does, and it did, but that was in a different time and a different place, right, than we live in now. Uh, life has gotten awfully complex. Uh, yeah, just, uh, when, what about murmurations? <coughs> when we fish swim together and there's no leader. Is this okay. emergence too? Is this? It is. They, they have a rule, uh, and you see it in birds, right? Uh, and the rule is uh, I have to be three inches away on all sides from the, the bird next to me, or the fish next to me. And it's a measurable distance and they can see it, uh, and they can feel it in the way the air is moving around them. Uh, and that's, that's how they move like that. They're not thinking about it. It's just, follow, I'm following the rule. And the rule says turn left, and then I turn left, and we're all turning left, oh my God. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, oh, our, my sociologist friend, would you be willing to come back and do a talk? She has. I have actually. Yes, she has. She has. She has. She has. She has. She has. Oh, did I miss it? I'm sorry. Well, then I have to do another one. Just yes, so you can absolutely. Do it. absolutely. Uh, um, we're getting towards the end here, uh, so we'll just have uh, one more question. Two more questions. All right, I'm confused. Uh, you, you said ants don't know anything. Yeah. And then you said they can't get too far from the nest because they need to know how to get back to the nest. Uh, right, there has to be some kind of chemical signal or directional signal uh, for them to find their way back, right? So it's not that they know it in their head, but that they're stubbing in, in the pheromone trail? Yeah. How to get back. Uh, sure. So you're saying that the knowledge is not stored in that? Yeah, in and the, the, there's another thing I left out of the talk, but when ants go foraging, mm -hmm. they actually follow a mechanical rule that says, walk this distance, turn right, walk this distance, which is a shorter distance, turn right, shorter distance, turn right, and turn right again, and now back to square one, walk this distance. 
So it was, they're doing this pattern of walking. Mm -hmm. uh, so when they leave the area that's covered by pheromone trails, they could keep repeating that pattern and at some point reverse it and they'll get back to where they started. But terrains aren't necessarily flat and smooth and you know there is a danger of getting lost. And ants do get lost and they end up alone and they die. And you know, but you see them on the but, sidewalk. But the instructions are not in the pheromones, right? The no, that's that's built into the the way the brain works. So since, you know, the, since it's built into them and it's part yeah. of their body, yeah. to follow these rules, yeah. don't they know these rules? No. There's no knowledge going on. It's um, yeah, there's room by now how to do it. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to come up with an analogy that people can all understand. <laughs> Here, let's <laughs> Okay, I think um, last one. I, I just uh, thinking that uh, one of the things we have to consider is the impact that technology is having on our evolution. And, and the way in which we are looking at the world is, is, is starting to change. And one of the things I've noticed is there's a discrepancy now, or, or, or a dichotomy now, between how we view people in, in public life, which I think has an impact on, on uh, our, our social and political uh, yeah. environment right now. This has and what, nothing to do with evolution. <laughs> well, in, in the sense, in the sense of evolution of our, of our, of our, observa of our observational abilities, let's say, okay, in, in, in that, um, there was a time, for example, just one, one example, where we, we used to judge people based on their, on, on, their, on their reputation. Okay, now that's changed. Because now we have people in public life who, you know, play a particular role, but their personal life can be a shambles. Okay, but, but you know, like, like you have sports uh, uh, figures who, you know, personally, their, their lives are falling apart. But when they get on the playing field, everybody roots for them. And I think the same thing happens in, in, in the political life, or, or in, like you know, Johnny Carson, for example, who you know, was, a, was a bastard off, off, uh, you know, off stage. But uh, you know, everybody tuned him in. Okay, so I think there's, there's a dichotomy between how we view people when, when they're presented on the TV screen, as opposed to how we used to judge them, which was you know, put by the, by the reputation. And I think the two have been uh, you know, split apart to the point where where uh, you know, we don't have a clear picture, you know, or we don't judge people based on what they actually are, but on what we see uh, presented to us. Uh, it's always know. been that way. Well, I think it's gotten a lot worse, and I think it's, it's a lot more powerful now because we have the images in front of us. Whereas, you know, 100 years ago, that wasn't possible. Yeah. Again, that, that really has nothing to do with evolution. <laughs> All right, well, um, I think that will do it. One last big round of applause for uh, Ron. Very good. Uh, again, thanks everyone for coming. There is. Uh,